Hello, good morning and good afternoon to those of us joining from, uh, from Asia. We are starting the webinar soon. However, we see that we still have some participants joining. Um, so we'll give them a couple of minutes and then we'll kick it off. Thank you for your patience. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the CBI webinar <clears throat> about circularity in the apparel sector and why it should be a priority. We are very excited to have you joining us today, and we really hope to be able to share some information um, that you will find insightful um, and that you will find useful as you go through the process of thinking about what circularity means to you, to your business, your value chain, or your association. Um, so we were having a look at the list of participants this morning and noticed that we have quite a nice mix, so we're excited about that. Uh, we have primarily I see exporters from a variety of countries, including India, Bangladesh, Egypt, and Nigeria. Welcome to you all. Um, but we were also happy to see that we have quite some European importers here online with us today. Uh, we also do like to see that mix in our webinars. Um, and notice as well that we have quite some business support organizations, trade associations, and um, people from the ministries joining us. So welcome to all. Um, on my side, I am Simona Snuyenbos. I will be your host for this webinar. I'm a program manager at CBI, which I will introduce shortly, and in charge of the apparel sector within CBI. Um, however, for the course of our webinar today, you won't be hearing so much from me, but you'll be mainly hearing from our experts uh, who will be introducing themselves as they get to their part of the webinar. Before we start out, and also keeping in mind that I see we still have attendees joining, um, let's have a look at a couple of rules and uh, housekeeping for today's webinar. So for today, we'll be using GoToWebinar. Some of you may be familiar with it. Some of you may even have previously joined CBI webinars before. But for those of you who haven't, um, first and foremost, it's important for you to know that we cannot see or hear you. So if everything is going right, you can see and hear me properly. But on your end, um, if there's anything you would like to share with us, uh, you will need to make use of the questions tab which you should be able to see in the control panel on the right side of your screen. Feel free to, to comment, to ask questions as we go through the webinar. Um, we will mainly be answering questions uh, at the end of each of the sections of the webinar, and we'll also have uh, a good 20 minutes towards the very end of the session to engage in conversations, to make sure our panelists can really dive into some of your questions. Uh, so feel free to keep it going. Don't be disappointed if it's not addressed uh, right away. 
because we may be keeping it for, for a later part of the webinar. Um, important also for you to know that this session is being recorded uh, and that means in practice is that you will also be able to um, have a look at it once it's published um, in the coming days. Also, um, you will be receiving the PowerPoint. So all of those who registered for this webinar, including perhaps any of your colleagues or people in your network who wanted to attend, but for some reason were unable to, um, will be receiving the PowerPoints and the slide deck uh, after this presentation. So no need to, to take notes. All right, so let's start out with having a look at our agenda and what we'll be learning about today. So I'll just kick it off with a very short introduction of CBI, the organization hosting the webinar for today. Um, and then I'll hand over the, the floor to our first expert, Franz, who will give you a quick overview of what Europe is currently doing to push circularity, particularly on the side of legislation, um, and what of these, which of these developments you really need to keep an eye on uh, when it comes to circularity in the sector. After that, we'll give the floor to our second expert, Giovanni, who will be presenting the trends and opportunities that this push for circularity is bringing in general, but also specific to the sector. Um, and we'll close it off with our third panelist, uh, Jeanette, who will be presenting some best practices and kind of a case study of a Dutch company, Groenendijk, and everything they've been doing as a front runner of implementing circularity in the apparel sector. And as I mentioned previously, we will have a short section at the end where we wanna get back to, to your questions and to any comments and just have a kind of free flowing conversation between, between our panelists about, um, about circularity and everything that's happening in the sector and, and the changes that are being implemented both from the legislative side, but also from initiatives on the, on the private sector side. So starting it out with um, a quick explanation about what CBI is and does. So CBI is actually, actually an acronym. It starts, stands for the C Center of Promotion of Imports from Developing Countries. We are an agency of the government of the Netherlands. So we are a governmental agency and uh, we are funded by the Ministry of, of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. Um, our mission is to support the transition in sustainability and we do that um, by connecting small and medium-sized enterprises such as many of, of you to the European market um, and to so stimulate sustainable and inclusive economic growth. The way we do this is um, by strengthening the economic environmental and social sustainability of SMEs um, and we encourage the exports of value-added products to Europe but also to uh, regional markets of the countries that these SMEs are based in. Now our focus as CBI and as, a, as an agency is to help find practical solutions to some of the most common bottlenecks we see that SMEs are, are facing when starting to export to, to Europe or, or when they're already doing, but are looking to somehow improve or, or scale up their exports. And one of those bottlenecks that, that we hear a lot about is, is the lack of good market information that SMEs in other countries have. Of course, we know that Europe is not always a very easy market to break into. And even if you've been able to access it, there's always room for, for improvement, for, for increasing your competitive position. Um, and that's why one of the main things that we do at CBI is um, sharing, creating and sharing market information. So if we go on to the next slide, we can have a look at what that entails. When we refer to market information, we're basically talking about a set of market studies, um, as well as very practical tips uh, and fact sheets that we provide freely and free of charge on our website of cbi.eu slash market information. We really try to make sure that the information shared on this website um, is written in a way that it is practical and applicable to our target group, which are exporting SMEs, whether they're aspiring or already currently engaging in business with Europe and in developing, coming from developing countries primarily. So we work on a number of sectors uh, of which apparel is a very important one. 
And what we try to provide is an information about um, what the market in Europe looks like, uh, what is its potential, what are its intricacies, um, and then link that to practical information about how you can best access it and how you can position yourself with it. So that includes very practical information um, about, for example, finding buyers, about the kind of requirements that you need to meet. And very soon, we will also be publishing um, a set of tips that will explain and give you some practical advice on how, as a company in the apparel sector, you can become more environmentally sustainable and become more socially responsible, which we know are very strong uh, value-added elements for companies uh, looking to find European buyers. And that's part of what we'll be looking at today as well. Um, and with that, uh, I would like to keep, invite you to keep an eye out for these, uh, for these tips coming up soon, um, to dive into our website for those of you who haven't used it, uh, click through it and um, make yourself familiar with the market information that we have because it, it truly is um, very useful. Part of the market information and part of what we have published on there also include previous webinars, such as this one, so you can have a look at whether there are other topics um, that are also relevant to you and your area of interest. Having said that, I'll, uh, I'll hand it over to our first expert to kick off the actual content of, of our webinar for today. Thanks so much, uh, Simone, and um, thank you all for joining today. I would like to, um, my name is Frans Tilstra. I'm a market researcher um, working for the CBI apparel sector. And today I would like to give you a quick overview of the situation in Europe in uh, regarding circularity from the perspective of, perspective of the European Union and its member states. So first of all, um, in terms of circular fashion, what's what's happening in the um, in the European Union? So, um, the European Union is a, a large market for uh, for fashion. Uh, I'm sure you all know, and this results in a also a large amount of textile waste, around 11.3 um, kilograms per end consumer uh, per year in in the EU. Uh, which amounts to 5.8 million tons. So that's a huge amount of waste, which is also growing in, um, uh, from 2000 to 2015. The total textile production has doubled and it is expected to double again by 2030. Um, this is primarily because um, we're consuming more fashion and also because we are wearing our fashion items uh, ever few times, so around seven times for fast fashion. You can ask yourself, what's happening to all this fashion that's entering the European market? Well, um, currently only around 1% of all this uh, apparel is, um, is recycled in a, in a circular manner. So most of all the fashion that is discarded in Europe is exported either as second hand or it is downcycled outside of Europe or it is downcycled landfilled or incinerated within Europe um, and as you may all be familiar with the um, with the sustainability impacts of apparel production it's not difficult to imagine what uh, huge um, benefits there are for circular fashion. So we can reduce the use of virgin materials, fibers and dyes. Uh, we can reduce the energy consumption, the water consumption, reduce pollution if we make the shift towards a circular fashion industry within the EU. So currently we are far from that ideal, but the European Union has a vision on the uh, apparel industry and it's very ambitious to be honest. So um, in the EU's textile strategy, the European Union has indicated that it wants basically all textile products, all apparel items also uh, imported into, into the EU to be circular. Um, so that means 
um, a lot, not only for importers, but also for their suppliers, the manufacturers in the manufacturing countries. Um, uh, so, for instance, it needs to be recyclable. Um, the EU has uh, grand visions for the uh, amount of recycled fibers that are used in, uh, in the garments. It needs to be free of harmful substances produced with respect for worker rights. And the EU has also um, laid down a lot of ambitions in the textile strategy for the use phase. So the role of the consumers themselves also needs to change. So the EU wants to see higher quality garments on the market that can be used longer, that can be reused, repaired. Um, so as I already mentioned, we are currently far from this ambition, but the EU is working on it. For instance, um, by introducing all kinds of new legislations. So here you see another quick overview of um, all the different initiatives and all the different ambitions that the EU has laid down in this strategy. Um, we are going to need to design garments for recycling. What this uh, means in, in practice, um, our expert Jeanette will also explain later on in her um, in her presentation, there needs to be the introduction of a digital product passport that tells end consumers exactly how products are made. The EU wants to also tackle greenwashing and to um, eradicate all kinds of exaggerated or false claims about sustainability. Um, it wants to reverse overproduction and uh, discourage the destruction of unsold or returned textiles or overstock. Um, the EU is um, proposing extended producer responsibility and uh, what that exactly means I will tell you uh, in, a, in a second. There is new legislation coming up about the unintentional release of microplastics um, and as I already mentioned a lot of the textile waste currently is exported out of Europe and this is also something that the EU wants to work on. It wants to keep its textiles within the European Union and make sure it is dealt with in a circular manner within the EU itself. So as I already mentioned, um, the EU has a textile strategy. It has also introduced a, a green deal um, and all these ambitions and all these things that are laid down in the vision, they're not all legislation yet. So how it usually works in uh, within the European Union is that the European Commission will come up with a proposal, it will present it to the European Parliament, then it will go back and forth until um, the European Council decides on implementing and making it law. This process usually takes a couple of years and all these different initiatives, they have a different timeline. But I can already tell you about some of the new um, the new directives that are coming up and some are already implemented and others you should expect in the coming years. So for instance the, the right to repair for consumers. This is basically um, the idea that consumers in the European Union after they buy a product they have a right to repair. This is a proposal, and this also applies to textiles. This is a proposal that is adopted by the European Commission uh, this year. So this is something that we should be uh, expect to be implemented in the in the coming years. Regarding due diligence um, uh, for worker rights and environmental protection, this is already law. So this means that importers in the EU they need to do their due diligence within the supply chains that there is, uh, the garments are produced with respect for worker rights. This is already happening. Later on this year, the Waste Framework Directive will be revised. Um, and one of the things that's in the Waste Framework Directive is that the EU wants all textile waste in all the member states to be collected separately uh, within two years. So this also means that um, it is to be expected that the total amount of textile waste within the EU will grow when it's collected separately. Um, and this stresses the need for circular solutions for, for textile waste. 
Another thing that the EU is very fond of is EPR schemes. And as I already mentioned, um, this is the idea that uh, importers or manufacturers are basically responsible for apparel throughout the life cycle, even after sales. I will tell you a little bit more uh, in, a, in a bit. Um, there's anti-deforestation regulation uh, that's all, also already adopted, will be introduced in the coming years. This applies for now to leather and a number of other commodities. Um, and this has huge, has huge consequences for um, requirements regarding transparency. So anyone who wants to export leather, not yet leather products, but uh, leather to the EU needs to show where the animals have lived that the leather was produced from. Um, and then as already mentioned, currently legislation about the intentionally added mi microplastics has been adopted. But the Euro European Commission has already asked for research on the impact of unintentionally uh, shedded, shedding microplastics. This is happening this year, so it may be expected that in the coming years there will be new legislation introduced about the shedding of microplastics from textiles. If you want to know more about um, uh, all the new initiatives and, and, and directives that are coming up, then the new proposals, uh, I would advise you to go and take a look at the, um, at the website of the European, um, European Union, the European Commission, where you can find the Circular Economy Action Plan and um, there's more background information about new legislation coming up. So a little bit more about EPR. Um, as I mentioned, the idea of extended producer responsibility is that importers of apparel and manufacturers within the EU, but this is also uh, consequences for the suppliers of the importers, is that companies are re uh, financially responsible for the entire life cycle of a garment. And this also includes the collecting and the recycling and also the reusing um, after sales, so in the waste phase, basically. Um, this is not yet a um, EU-wide law, but um, several member states are already experimenting with the EPR. For instance, in, in the Netherlands, an EPR will be introduced later this year. So um, this is something that will also have consequences for the suppliers of European garment buyers. As I already mentioned, a lot of these initiatives and proposals and directives and new legislation, they have different timelines. If you want to keep track of what's happening in the, uh, in the EU, I would like to refer you once again to the, uh, to the website of the European Commission where you can find a timeline and a lot of information about when certain proposals um, are sent to the, to the European Parliament and to the European Council. So um, on the website of the European Commission, you can keep track of uh, new legislation and when it will be introduced. One other thing about what's happening in, um, in the European Union with regard to the EU itself and also its member states, is that a lot of member states are already experimenting with uh, circular procurement. And this basically means that um, certain member states, when they put out tenders, for instance, for workwear or for other types of, uh, of textiles, they will set certain requirements, certain criteria, for instance, for the use of recycled content. So, um, there are different initiatives already going on in um, in the EU. Um, there's also a lot of information about this in our new report, Tips to Go Green. Um, but once again, if you want to know more, I would also like to refer you once more to the the website of the uh, of the European Commission, where you can find uh, background information on different experiments of U European member states with circular procurement. This is especially interesting, of course, if you are a workwear manufacturer, but also if you're a manufacturer of other types of textiles. Um, I, would, I would think that um, the member states that are experimenting with circular procurement, they're sometimes a little bit ahead of the, of the, 
of the legislation, so to speak. So this is, gives you a very good idea of what's coming in terms of uh, requirements for circular fashion. So thank you. Um, that was uh, that was it for from my side about um, what's happening in the European Union and its member states. And I would now like to give the floor to our next One. expert, Giovanni. Franz, perhaps before we move on, we could already tackle one question that showed up. I don't know how much clarity there is on this, but um, one of our participants asked related to the anti-deforestation regulation. Um, if we're looking at leather, where does that start in the value chain? Are we talking about finished goods as well? If somebody exports footwear that is uh, based on leather, would they have that same responsibility or is there no clarity on this yet? Now that's that's a really good question. Um, as I mentioned, um, this applies to to leather, so leather that is sold by the square foot, basically. It does not yet apply to ready-made products made from leather, um, but it it could be in the future. So this is a, a, a new directive that is introduced. Uh, it, it's adopted. It will be introduced um, uh, later next year. And the European Commission has already indicated that they will review it after one year. And um, they might, after the review, extend the legislation to other commodities. Um, and it could be that after a couple of years, they will also extend it to ready-made products. It's not yet in the legislation, but it's just to indicate um, that for certain products, the EU is basically um, putting out high ambitions in terms of traceability in this case. So it's something uh, to keep an eye on. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you so much. And um, with that, I would like to give the floor to Giovanni. Hello everybody. So my name is uh, Giovanni Beatrice and uh, I've been in the apparel manufacturing industry for over 30 years and um, for the EU market. Since 2014, um, I started to work as a consultant, sharing the expertise and, and knowledge I've gained over the years and um, advising companies and, uh, and sectors on, um, well, on how to cope with the sector challenges and opportunities, of which one, of course, is, uh, is recycle. I, I actually um, started a recycle program when I was still on the manufacturing uh, side of the industry of uh, using post-consumer waste to uh, to develop new products. And the interesting thing of what I noticed was the limitations of the um, uh, uh, recycling of post-consumer waste, the, the practical limitations. It's, it was not possible to make one new T-shirt from, let's say, two old T-shirts. Um, but also the opportunities, because I noticed that the raw material had almost no value. Uh, so when we developed products, and it was um, flat knit sweaters, uh, we developed the yarns in India, we manufactured in Cambodia, and we noticed that the final price was below the same product price made from virgin yarns, which increased the interest and the opportunity, of course. So. Besides the many challenges and issues that uh, uh, France has shown, um, problems create opportunities. And that is also what I would like to show you in my presentation. Next slide, uh, France. Yeah, so um, we're going through a transition. And um, I'm not talking about an individual transition. I hope we all need to change. We all need to adapt. But we also are going through a global transition. And um, it's all have been impacted by a couple of things. One of it, of course, was COVID. COVID has taught us that, um, uh, well, we need to change. We need to change the way we live and how we live. COVID results in, uh, in inflation, unfortunately. Inflation is caused by the changes in the market. Uh, we are all aware of the war uh, uh, between Russia and Ukraine. We had the um, trade war between the US and, uh, and China. Um, this all causes an, an increase, an increase of, um, of products, uh, an increase of costing. And um, 
uh, and we need to pay for it, and we are the consumers. Um, so, if we look at um, the uh, inflation, then we also uh, look at climate change. Now, we we have seen the climate change, and uh, the projected changes are immense, uh, which all has to do um, uh, with the impact that we have as a sector and as a consumer. Uh, on the environment. So the responsibility of minimizing the impact is not only the industry, but also the consumer. Uh, we as a consumer need to think differently. We need to behave differently. We need to realize that we have impact and that we have the power to change. Because if we do not, it will and is already impacting the biodiversity. Uh, uh, um, and, and, and how are we go going to do it? We've tried it the friendly way hoping that there would be solutions and now we're trying it the we, we need to do it the hard way by by legislation and law and that is what our government is doing our government is introducing a law simply because it wants to force change and um, uh, this is the only way only way possible so um, the good thing about it once we have a problem um, like a new legislation we are forced to change and we become creative so you see a lot of creative solutions already in the market, uh, which are inspiring and uh, and shows the the future of our industry. Uh, of course, governmental regulations and change reflect into into buyers changing their uh, requirements. Uh, every buyer now is sourcing uh, recycled materials. Every buyer now is talking about certification. And if we go 20 years back in time, it was only price and product. Um, so, uh, uh, a lot of changes in the market, uh, and again, the change is the opportunity here, which we will uh, identify further in the presentation. Next slide, uh, Frans. So, I would like to ask you a question. Um, if we look at impact, uh, negative impact, uh, many times we can also have a positive impact, but now we are talking about negative environmental impact. So, um, if we look at a consumer, a consumer that consumes uh, uh, products, uh, what product do you think has the biggest impact on the environment, biggest negative impact? Is it the meat we consume? Meat, um, uh, uh, we all know, perhaps you've seen the documentary, uh, or is it building construction, traveling, or apparel? What do you think has the biggest negative impact if it's correct, you can now make a choice. So meat is 18%, building construction 15%, traveling 13 apparel 54 That is an interesting one. So let's have a look at the statistics. Hans? Next slide, Hans. You should be able to see it right now. No, I still see the... Uh, there it is. Okay. Uh, on presentation mode, yeah. Yeah, let's let's. Sorry about that. Yeah. So the uh, biggest impact. Uh, I, I noticed there was a um, uh, a small mistake in the in the questions we uh, um, uh, asked you, because the biggest impact is consumer products. Uh, uh, the mobile phones we're using, uh, all the products we buy, interior products, that has the biggest environmental impact. The second is cars, then construction material, then meat, then flights, then food and beverage, and apparel. So apparel is not the biggest challenge. It's, I mean, don't get me wrong, apparel is a huge challenge, um, but there are also other product categories that we need to, uh, need to look at. And... Um, so it's consumer products, and how can we can we re reduce the impact? Is simply by buying less. Yeah, and of course, recycling is a solution to a problem, 
but the best way is to prevent the problem. And how do we prevent the problem? Is by buying less. Next one. So the first thing we need to look at is changing consumer behavior. And why are we now talking about changing consumer behavior? Because the uh, behavior change of a consumer impacts the de market demand and ultimately impact impacts what what you need to how you need to service your customer or what you need to manufacture so um we all talk, talk about how we are able to change the consumer behavior and uh, if i look at my children then i can already see a change they are uh, they purchase much more um uh, thinking about environmental impact where i old-fashionedly uh, are focused on price primarily so we already see a change in the in the new generation fortunately um, but what can we change huh? we talk about repairing uh, Franz already said that uh, we wear some items only seven times yeah, in the fast fashion uh, why don't we repair why we throw away because buying new is cheaper yeah um, uh, the fastest growing market right now in the apparel industry is the second hand market and the interesting thing is that you see brands already collecting repairing refurbishing and reselling on the second hand market they want to benefit from this growing market but you need to think on how can you benefit if you are manufacturing a developing country how can you benefit from this growing market well um, that's where we talk about um, a circular, a circular supply chain. But the way you manufacture uh, right now um, will not enable you to benefit from this growing second-hand market. So we will talk about some solutions uh, later on in the presentation. There is no old fashion or last season. The problem with fast fashion is not that it's being manufactured fast, but that people throw it away fast. And why? Because we create trends. And trends, well, the more often they change, the more often people buy new. And that is killing our environment. So we need to start realizing that we don't want uh, uh, seasons to change or fashion to change so fast. We want seasonless fashion. Yeah, We don't want fashion. We want products that we can use until they're damaged so severely that they're unusable anymore. That would be the ideal situation. We can upcycle and we can recycle uh, so we can um, uh, use our waste to make other products or we can use our waste to again uh, use it as as core material for new production next one so um, first tip is recycling starts with uh, increasing awareness on co uh, consumer level and uh, i travel a lot to many many different countries and um, i see that uh, still a lot of consumers are not aware still the local governments do not facilitate the consumers to um, um, start thinking about separating their garbage for recycle purposes so of course it all starts with the structure of recycling on consumer level and awareness Next one. So if we look at the availability of raw materials, in this case, oil and gas, um, how much more do we have until, for example, oil and gas is, is, is no longer there? I'm talking about our, our earth. Uh, we get oil and gas from our earth. How much longer do we have? Is it finished in 2045 or 2080? 2100 or 2250 when is it finished The results, Hans. Yeah. So, um, 2080. I wish it's 2045. Uh, if we look at the availability of uh, oil and gas, then it's finished in 2045. Can be 2050. Can also be 2040 because of the growing demand. So let's have a look at the next slide, Hans. 
Do you see the next slide right now? Or? Yes, yes, perfect. Okay, okay thanks. So, um, uh, oil and gas. Huh? We have noticed in our trade, in our, in our problems with uh, with Russia, how we depend on gas, for example. But it's finished in 2045. So the good thing about this um, uh, Russia gas problems is that we have um, developed alternatives. Huh? Once you have a problem, you find a solution. If there's no problem, you don't even think about solving uh, something that's not a problem. So. The fact that we um, uh, had this problem um, made us found solutions, but we don't have any oil and gas anymore in 2045. And how can we create plastics without oil in 2045? It's impossible, of course. Look at metals. I look at uh, indium, for example. We need that to make the batteries. It's finished in 2030. The, the, the demand for batteries is growing immensely. So how can you make batteries if there is no more Indian? Uh, why do you think Russia is going to Ukraine? It's because of the raw materials in in uh, in the Ukraine. Yeah. So uh, zinc, silver, gold, copper, it's all finished by 2040. So we need to realize that the only way we can uh, survive is by recycling these materials yeah, that we're using and not throwing them away. Next one. So what does it what does it mean eh, for the apparel industry? We all talk about circular circularity, linear economy. Um, the way we manufacture now is based on the linear economy model, which is um, uh, we grow the cotton, uh, we make the fabric, we make the product, and we export. Once it's ready, it's being thrown away. And as Franz explained to you, a lot has been thrown away, is thrown away, or um, or burned after use, unfortunately. So we need to work towards a circular economy. And um, a circular economy actually means there is no waste. Waste represents value. Uh, that's what we need to understand. And um, the only way forward is to create a circular economy, is endless opportunities for the waste that we produce. Yeah, and that is the the future we need to uh, work towards, which needs, which requires a lot of innovation, uh, and a lot of rules and regulation, and and a change. And each and every one, small factory, big factory, consumer, uh, governmental organization needs to work on this circular economy. There is no future without. Next one. So a question. How much of the EU waste do you think is currently recycled? Less than 10%, between 30 to 50%. And I'm talking about all the waste, not only apparel. All the waste we create. How much is recycled in the EU? Yeah, show me the results once. Oh, yes. 62% uh, less than 10%, you are right. Only 62%, um, uh, it's only 10% um, is recycled of all the waste that we create. And just imagine all the metals, all the plastics we throw away that represent value. Why? Why do we only um, uh, use 10% of the waste because not lack of innovation or lack of purpose, but lack of structure. We are not um, uh, ready. Our our economy is not ready in some countries to, to recycle our waste. Uh, we throw away money. That is bottom line what we're doing. Yeah, show me the slide, Hans. Huh? Yes. So if we look at what's happening in the EU, then we see Switzerland is on position number one. They recycle their waste for 52 percent. You know, this is a high percentage. Over half of the entire waste is recycled in Switzerland. US, 31.5 percent. Of course, there are countries who are not recycling at all. Uh, um, um, but what what tell what sh these numbers show us that there is a big potential. Yeah, we don't need to invent. 
if we as a country are not recycling, what do you do? Many countries try to create new structures based on their own thoughts and ideas, but why not copy? Copy paste is the simplest way to um, to create change. Why not go to Switzerland and see how they're doing it? Yeah. Ultimately, while wh why is Switzerland recycling so much is because they are able to create value out of waste. They're able to create demand um, uh, for products that are made from waste. Uh, you can recycle, but if there's no market demand or no purpose for the product you made from your waste, then it's no use. Yeah, and that's what what Switzerland did. Yeah, and with Switzerland, I'm very proud to see also the Netherlands with 46 percent. Yeah, so with Switzerland, um, uh, there are a lot of other countries also. So, if you want to change as a factory, as a consumer, as a country, it's important to think as a collective. Yeah, cooperate, collaborate, see how others are doing it, and try to implement. There's no way back. Recycle is the only way forward. Next one. Uh, Gio, we are a little bit behind schedule, so uh, yeah, no problem. So okay. um, uh, again, we uh, our government is um, teaching us to to use less. We don't need the things we buy in 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 the numbers we buy it. We need to use longer. Yeah, uh, we need to clean. We need to reuse. Yeah, there are many ways how we can reduce, reuse, and recycle our waste, and that's what this graphic is uh, is showing. It's on consumer level, but also on factory level. Next one. So create new ecosystems. This is a nice example. The droppings of the chicken feed the fish in the pond. Yeah, that's how you need to look at recycle. The waste represents value. The waste for some is value for others. Next one. This is coffee cups made from coffee waste. Yeah, I've never seen this. Why have I never seen it? Because it's not being massively used or 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 implemented. Yeah, so we need to we need to adapt these innovative products and um, and translate it to the to the mass market. Next one. This is an interesting one. A jewelry brand that uses CO2 from the air around us to make jewelry. Yeah. Next one. Uh, the core of the olive being used to make leather kind materials for the shoe industry. Yeah, how interesting is that? Next one. Um, fashion made from packing material. Of course, this is niche, but it shows us the potential of waste. Next slide. So we have different kinds of recycling. We have mechanical recycling, which is the toughest one. It means uh, products are sorted and um, um, uh, made into new yarns, fabrics, and products. The quality becomes less. So uh, creating a new product out of an old product, this is the, 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 the way with the least impact of all. Um, uh, it has challenges, uh, but it's happening, especially in the knitwear. Next one. Uh, thermal recycling, it's, it's like melting plastics. This is very successful. All the bottles into new polyesters, uh, the, the PET polyester, um, uh, has, the, the demand has increased substantially over the last years. Um, but there is a new legislation that no longer allows it. So it needs to change. Yeah, thermal recycling is a second way of recycling. Next one. Third way of recycling is the chemical recycling. Of course, the words already says it. Chemical includes chemicals, which is not the perfect way to reduce the impact uh, on our uh, on our environment. But this is the third way of uh, of recycling. This enables us, on a, from a technical perspective, to create a high quality product that complies to the market expectations and uh, and demands. Next one. So, let's have a look. Again, I told you, you don't need to invent yourself, but collaborate. These are recycle factories worldwide. You can see them almost in, on every continent. There is a recycle factory. So if you are interested in recycling, of course, it's good to think on what you can do, what you can develop to create your own unique position in the market. But it's perhaps easier to look at what's already out there. Yeah, collaborate with others, implement and uh, and develop circular business models by by collaborating. 
as you understood from France's story, the buyers are responsible for the waste in the market, are held responsible. So they need to start collecting. What do they do? They cannot send it back to China. So how can you create a structure that will enable the buyer to collect and send back and then repair or recycle? Collaborate. Next one. So why focus on recycling of apparel? Just look at these numbers. In 2030, we grow from 4 billion in 2021. These are projected sales to 6 billion in 2030. So with the, these new legislations that France has um, uh, presented to you, the, the uh, recycled content and recycled products will grow massively in the next years. If you do not, take this opportunity, then, um, um, well, you will lose out on your market share and on your um, export towards the EU market. Okay, next one. So I would like to introduce you to Jeanette van der Stoel, and she works for a very interesting company called Groenendijk that she will uh, tell you all about it. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Giovanni. So, hi everyone. My name is uh, Jeanette van der Stoel, and I'm a corporate responsibility manager at the uh, Groenendijk Bedrijfskleding. Uh, it's a Dutch name, Dutch company, uh, but it's a workwear brand. And today I will tell you all about circularity. Next two slides, please. So, I will explain a little bit in short what uh, Groenendijk is. So Groenendijk is a worker company founded in 1997. It started with um, shoes and, um, well, eventually it developed to, to garments. We focus mainly on the, the bigger uh, brands uh, within the Netherlands. Um, and we uh, are located in Woerden. In a, it's in the center of the Netherlands. And we have our whole logistics um, in in-house so we also have an own studio for embroidery and printing um, we have around 150 employees and um, well we send um, many packages daily to the to the customers but we are mainly focused also on cir circularity and sustainability um, that's from the packaging but also the the company itself we have many certifications uh, based on co2 emissions but also social inclusiveness and um, but I'm um, responsible for circularity. So next slide, please. Um, this and these are some of our biggest custom, uh, customers. So it's the police, the defense. We um, produce for them the combat boots and work boots, um, but also technical garments, uh, costumes, security companies. If you fly from Schiphol Airport, you will go through security, and we made the. The, the garments for them. Next slide. So, in short, what we all do for, for at Grunendijk on sustainability and circularity is about circular workwear, um, social and transparent supply chain, so social inclusiveness, and also to reduce the environmental impact. So that's on eco efficiency. Today, I will mainly talk about uh, circular workwear. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a Dutch image, but it shows like many different sites. So there is a lot of EU regulations, but also within the Netherlands. Um, there, the government wants a circular economy by 2050. And we have our own timeline for this um, to improve on both the processes, but also a material level. Um, and this image, it's you see many things happening. It's from an R strategy. So from design for recycling, long fit, um, and in, in, in the end, recycling. So we'll go into depth about these topics. And um, first, I start with Circtex. Next slide. That's a European uh, project. Um, so Grune Nike was the took the initiative. Um, you see the, the the product. It has reflective striping, um, and it's uh, very hard to to recycle. Um, so what we uh, thought this is a challenge. We want to see if we are able to recycle this garment because first it was just burnt down. So then we started in 2019, um, went to Interreg from the European Union and started this project Circtex. And therefore we de uh, did need many different partners within Europe to develop a garment. 
um, a garment is quite technical. You have a membrane, um, but also the fabric itself, the zipper buttons. And we came up with, um, with a yarn because the reflective striping still wasn't polyester. We wanted to make the product only uh, out of polyester um, because that's the, the fabric to use um, because you can upcycle it and you can reuse the polyester. And we came up with the yarn stitched on the reflective striping and near the zipper. Um, and it goes after it's been worn out, it goes through like a big microwave and the yarn breaks and therefore you can zip, uh, take off the, the reflective striping in the zippers. And well, in the end, you can recycle the other parts which are 100% polyester. Uh, next slide. So what we did, we started with the designing part. It was quite um, difficult um, to, to make all the different components of a product um, from 100% polyester. Um, but in the end, we, we managed. So this is, these are some pictures of the production process of the fabric and the pattern laying and the um, confectioning. Next slide, you see the different garments we produce. So it's both high visibility orange with the reflective striping and the black garments. And uh, what we also added was an RFID tag um, within the products. So you can actually read out what the uh, product consists of based on the materials. Um, so next slide, um, the products were worn. Um, so we did test all the, of these different products um, on also on the comfort level. And then we took back all the products and it was disassembled. So this is what I explained with the yarn. Um, so you can see the before and after. Um, so the reflective striping was taken off and also the zippers. Um, so in this way, you can actually recycle the remaining part of polyester. Um, next slide. And here you see an overview of this whole process. Um, you see m many different components. So in the end, we did uh, chemical uh, recycling on the products. And at this point, um, we managed to recycle it because we were um, we didn't know uh, if, if there would come oil on the product or something else, um, if we were still able to recycle it, but in the end it worked out. And at this point, um, a new jacket is been produced out of the, the Circtex garments from 100% uh, polyester. And what I want to show with this image is that you need so many different partners and collaboration to actually make it work. Um, to go to work towards a circular product. And um, well, it's just isn't only confectioning, it uh, consists out of different components, but also testing all the time if it really consists out of 100% polyester. Okay, next slide. So with all of this knowledge, um, Groen and Eich also um, started to make their own uh, clothing line. Um, this is not yet la launched, um, but in this picture you can see from the enforcement uh, garments, it was also stitched with a uh, wear to yarn, and therefore after the use of wearing it, you can take uh, out the different components and you see in the middle picture that it still has a reflective striping. So that part you, well, we say you downcycle it, so you make it a, a, an, another product, but the other components you can actually upcycle it, so make it a new product like a garment. And you also see two socks and these socks are made of police polos. So that's post-consumer waste and turned into a, a new sock. Next slide, slide please. Um, so what I wanted to show with this example as well is the R ladder strategy, that at first you start thinking about how to design a product that in the end can be recycled, so design for recycling. But at the same time, you also want to make a product which can take, well, which you can have for a long time. And in the end, the last step is recycling. So therefore, it's important that you also take back the, the garments. Next slide. Um, so this was already mentioned also by France, the extended uh, producer responsibility. 
um, for us brands, we are responsible for taking back the garments. And we uh, at Groenendijk already did that. Uh, next slide. Um, so we have our own return system for a couple of years. Um, you have a textile point back, we call it, and we place this at, uh, con at, at our consumers, our clients, um, because uh, in workwear we have contracts from sometimes five to seven years. So within this contract, we can just place a textile point back and the wearers can put their garments in, but also their shoes. And then on the next slide, um, it shows an example what we do with this. So we want to extend the lifetime of a product and therefore we have a refurbishment pro program. Um, so the garments come back and we check if we could still reuse it. So um, we will clean it, we will sometimes repair it, but only the small parts. Um, and then at the end, you have a safety check and it goes back to the, the wearer. So it will extend the lifetime. Um, and if that's not possible, then we recite wood and we aim for 100% circularity, like Circtex, that you can actually make a new uh, garment out of it. Um, but we also do, well, downcycling is, is it what it's in is what it's called, but actually you still make it into a new product like isolation. Um, I think many of you are aware of this. Uh, next slide. Um, so in terms of what is circularity in the market, um, in the Netherlands we made uh, a scheme to, to actually say if your product is uh, um, circular or not. And if you look on the left side, you see at first post-consumer material, that you can recycle, remanufacture, repair, and reuse. But post-production material, um, you can only recycle, remanufacture, and the production waste, uh, so cutting waste, there is no way you can repair this, so you can only recycle it. And open loop material is, for example, repat. Um, so it comes from another industry, and therefore we call it open loop. And this is what is, been discussed as in what terms you can say a product is circular or not. Next slide. And I want to conclude with all of this information. Um, we are also working to uh, digital product passwords. So what Groenendijk does is already also tracing uh, the products. So um, we see where our products came from and then we will add um, here it says a Be Aware score, that's an LCA calculator, lifecycle analysis calculation, and it shows our environmental impact. And all this information we want to put on a, a digital product passport, which could, for example, be in an RFID within a product, and then, you, then the recycler can read out the information of the product composition, the materials used, but it could also um, be used to see how long a product has actually been worn in order to uh, give it a second life. So in an AU level, they are working towards this and also um, we as a brand are also looking into this very much. So I want to conclude my presentation um, with let's all work towards a circular supply chain. Next slide. Um, and then, um, uh, thank you for your attention. Um, and if you want, you can follow me on LinkedIn via the QR code. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Jeanette. That was very interesting. Quite some ambitious changes uh, you guys are making over there. We still have around 20 minutes um, for an open space for us to have some conversation. I've noted down some questions um, that we've received from our audience, but perhaps just looking back at our last presentation, Jeanette, before you go away, um, are there any challenges you would like to highlight? What were the biggest challenges that, that you guys faced as you implement this uh, circularity? I think uh, it's, a, it's a lack of well, innovation. So still you have to develop the new innovations. And for example, if you want to make a product from post-consumer waste, 
um, there is a limitation on the post-consumer waste or um, if you want to recycle it um, still the techniques are sometimes lacking um, so these are some challenges we face when working towards circularity yeah and if you look at some of these uh, the companies that we have online with us today um, that are based outside of Europe do you think there are any practical tips that you can give along to them um, so you mean I'm based on on circularity where they have to work towards sure if you think about a company that hasn't quite started on their circularity journey for example um, what do you think some low-hanging fruit or, or first steps could be to start implementing it so I would first look at what in the end what do you want to set on the market if you are a brand in order to have a, a lifetime of the product and recycle it so if you put many different materials or um, many different zippers then it's uh, more difficult to to recycle it so i think the first step would actually be what if i put, place a product on the market what in the end can i do with this product and then be very aware of what you what you produce um, so I think that would uh, be a first step. Great, thank you so much. And I do encourage uh, those of you in the audience perhaps to to follow Jeanette on, on LinkedIn. Not sure what she's posting there, but you might uh, learn a thing or two from, um, from the best practices they're implementing over at Rune Day. I saw another question that perhaps might be a good fit for Giovanni. We don't see you right now, but I assume you're still with us. Um, you have, there you are. I'm here. You have introduced um, the the importance of, of, uh, of implementing change and, and, and the, the contribution of different sectors to, to waste. Um, someone was asking, what's, what are the specific contributions of the apparel sector to climate change? What are the channels through which you see this happening? The contributions, you mean, uh, what are the climate change impact caused by the apparel industry? Yes. Um, uh, well, uh, one, important one is is transport uh, we need to make sure that we minimize reduce the ways we transport and and also uh, make sure that um, we do it in the in the most friendly way possible so not not use the airplane for example uh, uh, electrical boats are uh, are now coming up uh, electrical transportation so that would be a, a good one um, then if you look at it on a factory level, then uh, you need to look at uh, how can I minimize the energy I use? How can I minimize the gas I use? Um, uh, and also think how do I recycle my waste that's on a, on a, um, a factory level that produces ready-made products. Then you look, uh, uh, for example, on growing the cotton. What are the chemicals I use? Can I replace them by environmental uh, harmless chemicals? Uh, dyeing. What are the dyeing materials we use? Can I uh, replace them by environmental um, uh, friendly uh, dye stuff? Um, it, it all needs, uh, uh, as Jeanette are also saying, it, it all it all needs innovation. It all needs testing and experimenting, but it also needs a change of mindset. We need to understand that um, uh, if we have the same expectations for recycled products, um, uh, as we do from products made from virgin material, we will be disappointed because uh, if we look at the current um, uh, quality level of recycled products, um, especially the mechanical recycled product, products, the quality level is lower than virgin. And, and that is the biggest, the biggest challenge we're facing, I think. So many different steps to reduce the impact uh, within the entire supply chain. Yeah, absolutely. There's another question that I think might be interesting for us to hear your take or also Francis on because you introduced it um, when we started the webinar. So Franz, you talked about how um, we see that Europe often ends up exporting its waste and this is something that we don't see as, as desirable. Um, however, if we talk about circularity and I think that's what this question is kind of going into in that direction. Um, would there be any fit benefits to trying to figure out how to find ensure that that waste gets back to the original manufacturer who may actually not be based in Europe. How do you see that? Yeah, for sure. That That's um, that's an interesting question. Um, in the end, it all comes down to uh, closing the loop, so to speak. So what's happening now is that um, uh, textile waste is exported out of Europe 
and Europe basically loses all control or insight in how um, and what happens to that textile waste at the end of its life cycle. So we know that around half of all the textile waste that is exported currently from Europe ends up in the, on the second-hand market, um, which has it, its own issues. I mean, um, for instance, a lot, of, a lot of it ends up in Africa and Asia. There are already several countries in Africa that have closed their markets for, for second-hand mm. textiles from Europe because it's killing their own uh, textile business. Um, but that's another story. The other half ends up um, being downcycled into rags or isolation materials, as Jeanette already mentioned. Um, so it has a purpose, but it doesn't have it doesn't have the purpose that the EU would like to see. Basically, that we close the loop and make it truly circular and repurpose um, textile waste into new textile products, new apparel products. Mm. Um, so the the question about what what should be the role of the manufacturers it's that's an interesting one um what we already see is that um many recycling factories are set up in a ring around europe so close to europe so for instance in north africa or in turkey um it makes most sense to uh, to have a closed loop um that is geographically close to europe um, but still, um, the, the most important thing is that, that we do have closed loops. So, um, yeah, for sure, manufacturers in other producing countries could certainly play a role if, they are, um, uh, if their governments even allow textile waste to be imported back into their countries. But this is also a legis legislative uh, issue. Mm. Um, but it, it all depends. Basically, so, so transport does have its environmental impact, but you should view it in a holistic way. I mean, if you, if you do the math and if you run the numbers and you can make a case that it's sustainable and you can close the loop with the with a, with a recycling facilities in your producing country, uh, then you should certainly do it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And keeping in mind, of course, what Giovanni just told us about transport being one of the largest contributors, right? As you mentioned, you don't you do want the loop to be to geographically make make sense. So we've spoken about manufacturers. I see a question about apparel agents uh, who help brands develop and who source garments, but who don't actually have a hand in manufacturing themselves. What are some quick wins or steps towards circularity that you see agents taking? Um, if I can say one thing about that, um, many people think uh, in the supply chain that um, even though they are part of the supply chain, they don't carry the responsibility of the entire supply chain. And that is wrong. Uh, if you are an agent and you do not have your own factory, it does not mean you do not have the responsibility of how the things are manufactured or what's being done with the waste or the impact on the environment so even as an agent you carry the entire responsibility not even on the back side of the market so manufacturing and fabrics and input but also on the front side of the market you are also responsible for what the buyer is doing and how they collect the waste etc etc but what an agent could do um, is, uh, for example, um, sit down with his supply chain partners and talk about uh, um, a circular uh, certification. Uh, so how can we get the certification of uh, for circularity? Or uh, what do we do with the waste? Where are the opportunities? As a collective, I always motivate people to do things together and not alone. And that's also something Jeanette showed really, really clearly. They didn't invent the wheel themselves. By collaborating with others, they, had, they created a unique concept. Uh, so um, do it together. Sit down with your supply chain partners and talk about these market developments and market solutions. And I would like to add on that traceability could also work since if you, as a brand, you start with traceability and you want to know where you pro the greedy comes from and you see the textile market is very intransparent and there are so many sublines. And if actually all the uh, tiers are involved in this, then we'll, we would actually have more insight and we could also make more impact on the different levels of the supply chain. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I see a final confir a confirmation here as well of somebody mentioning that there are agents only working with sustainable brands and it's it's important to identify them as well um, from the side of the manufacturers if you want that to be a part. Exactly. Um, let's see. Feel free to keep writing questions. We've gone into certification and audit systems a bit. Would you be able to say anything about what the top US certification or audit system would be with regards to circularity? Um, uh, with regards to circularity, there is one. Um, uh, uh, GSR, GSR um, the uh, circular, global circular, I need to look it up. It's it, there's one for specifically for circularity, but if you look at sustainability, there is RAP. RAP certification is the most required certification from the U.S. market, but it's not um, uh, specifically for circularity. GRS is the one for circularity, but you also have uh, others which play a significant role, which is, uh, for example, um, uh, the goods certification or the Ecotex certification. It's not directly connected to. Uh, circularity, but also very important. But perhaps Jeanette can uh, elaborate a little bit more on uh, certification. Yeah, I think you you, you can distinguish to, for uh, your supply uh, suppliers. You have audit reports, and I'm for EBCI Smeta S A eight thousand ZX. These are some of the names of the uh, audit. Uh, a report and then you also have a material level and that could be uh, GOTS, GRS, RCS based on the on the content you have and um, yeah that's based on if it's a biological material or recycled material and there you also have certifications on and then you could also have um, more in the supply chain on a chemical level you have a uh, restricted substances list based on CETHC guidelines so it depends on where in the supply chain you are, you have different certifications and reports. I would like to add one thing. There are some organizations like Jeanette is referring to ZDHC, which are, are really the market leaders. And uh, often factories see certification as a headache, but certifications also offer, offers you the know-how on, on, uh, on the market. So ZDHC offers a big database of of chemicals, for example, that you can do to that you can use to replace um, the harmful chemicals that are currently being used. And ZDHC, like also Fashion for Good, represents a big number of uh, companies in the EU that are all connected to ZDHC and are really interested in in manufacturing facilities that are that are using these chemicals. Uh, um, so uh, don't be afraid, but but embrace. <laughs> Yes, and talking about embracing and indeed going going to that next level, we have a question, um, I assume from a manufacturer, as, telling us that they are already practicing circularity at a lower level by implementing zero waste policy and upcycling waste to new products. Um, how do you see them scaling this to, to a higher level? What would be the next step? For me, um, it's always, what I always recommend is start on your own local market first. Uh, mm -hmm. learn because if you start on the recycling the quality level of your products does not comply to to export standards so build your experience on the local ma local market first build your expertise get your products up to level once you feel ready then you uh, you can look towards uh, exporting Jeanette, any anything to uh, add yeah, so I want to elaborate in two parts. So in the Dutch market, uh, we uh, get more questions about the life cycle analysis of the whole supply chain. So you're now based on the material level, like zero waste policy, it's great. But uh, we also get many questions for from, for example, governments about the the energy used, the solar panel, uh, panels. Uh, if you also have, is you if your factory is actually uh, sustainable as well. So that's more based on the, well, on the building and also on um, material level. I would add, look at uh, some. If you're a manufacturer, look at which materials you could improve. Um, maybe uh, implement some cutting waste uh, for the for the fabrics and. Um, well, look at machinery with less energy use. Great. Um, 
Maybe this one is for you, Franz. You've been a, a little bit quiet the past minute. Um, so there was a question about the extended producer responsibility um, and its applicability to companies of different sizes. What can we say about that? To my knowledge, it applies to um, to the entire sector. Hmm. So, okay. um, so the differentiation between... Correct me if I'm wrong, Jeanette, but... Um, I don't think um, there's there's any way out for for the smallest of companies. No, I agree. <laughs> All right, so Sorry that's a, that. everyone. It applies uh, it, it applies across the board. Um, perhaps we can end it because uh, it would be good to start wrapping it up with a slightly philosophical question. I see here. Um, my question is, what do you think about green growth? Should we still strive for growth or should we try to globally reduce the production of products in general? And what is the role of circular economy in this? I see you smiling, Giovanni. Perhaps you have a first um, response. Yeah. Uh, um, um, uh, what I also mentioned in the presentation, we're trying to find a solution to our waste. But the first thing we need to look at is reduce our waste by using less. So uh, yes, we need to find for we need to look for green solutions to our problems, but uh, we need to also um, uh, restudy the way we are living, the way we are consuming, because that's no longer possible. That's how I feel about it. Yes, anything I, to add? I, 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 I totally agree. So, so one of the highest steps on the circularity ladder is actually refuse. Uh, I, I believe it's it's the highest step, um, which is often overlooked and um, so it's it's very specifically mentioned in the European textiles strategy as well I mean it's it's all about producing garments that actually last longer um, so that people will have to buy less might be more expensive because of more intricate producing processes but that's the idea I think it's a very interesting question because we are now such in a linear economy that you still buy many things and that we want to strive towards sustainability. But in the end, you also want to look nice and you still want to have your clothes on. And if I refer to the workwear industry, you still need workwear. But I do agree that we can reduce some garments. And this is always also uh, on consumer behavior and client behavior. Do you really need particular materials to be used or can we scale up that you use less fabrics that in order to recycle it or um, well maybe extend the lifetime so you have to produce less I think we we cannot escape from not producing anymore but we can look at the way to uh, produce less and use our garments longer great thanks to the three of you so before I start wrapping it up um, I would maybe just want to ask you three if there are any final reflections or messages uh, you would like to conclude with. Well, just if if I may add one thing to the to Jeanette's last remark. So, um, within the new circular economy, there's also going to be new business models, right? So we may produce less, but we may we may repair and refurbish more. So that doesn't mean per se that um, that the the economy might might scale down it's just that we're going to do things differently and i think uh, all in all that's a good thing yeah, re recycling is is not a choice recycling is a legislation and that's what we need to realize yeah that's a very strong note to end on. So um, I'd like to thank all three of you, our two experts, Franz and Giovanni, for participating today. And of course, our special guest, Jeanette. I saw there were some questions about uh, your LinkedIn handle, since people are keen to connect. Um, so I'm sure they can find you with your name on LinkedIn, right? Indeed. Yeah. And I assume if you put the company name there as well, you'll be able to, to find her profile. With regards to CBI, you will be receiving a couple of questions um, about how you experience the webinar. We would very much appreciate it if you could fill it in. The feedback is very useful for us to make sure that we continue to produce high quality webinars. Um, and finally, uh, through the same email, if you would be interested in, in sharing perhaps some 
additional insight into what you would like to see for future webinars, we would also really appreciate it. Uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn. I already saw a couple of requests coming through if you have any specific questions that you would like to follow up on. So with that, I'd like to close this webinar and, and thank you all very much for participating. Have a lovely day. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye.